Welcome to another episode of Off the Menu. I'm Vincent Franchini from Tumblr House here with the enigmatic Charles Coulomb. Enigmatic. Enigmatic. You're an enigma wrapped in mystery, wrapped in liberty. Oh, that last bit, I, I don't know what it does to the rest of it. It's only, it's only, well, thank you very much. I, uh, I, I, I can see they put a little more caffeine in the coffee in the uh, canteen this morning. Oh, yeah. That's good to hear. And considering, you know, the, uh, I, I think actually the food's improved at the canteen recently. Yeah? Yeah, I think so. I think so. For, just in time for Lent. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, I saw the, I mean, I, I have never seen pork cutlets in the canteen. And I was looking at them, and the, the lady behind the counter reminded me, Mr. Super Catholic, it's Lent. Yeah. I think the suits are torturing me on purpose. <sighs> I know. But you didn't have to deal that uh, with that for a week because you were in Washington. I was in Washington. How was that? It was great. It was great. It was, I saw old friends, made new ones. Um, saw her, um, you know, the widow and, uh, wife and husband and, uh, and husband, the widow and father and, uh, mother of a good friend of mine who just died. And that was, you know, we laughed, we cried, we sang, we danced, well, we laughed and cried anyway. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and of course I was in our nation's capital. I explored Georgetown. Um. Uh, I was taken on a tour by a company called Ark and Dove Ventures. You can look it up. Ark and Dove Ventures, who uh, took me on a tour of the Catholic sites of Southern Maryland. And boy, was that fun. It really was. And then I had Brunswick Stew in, the, uh, in a little place in Leonardtown mm -hmm. called um, the Veoli Village Grilli or something. But it was, it was quite nice. And I, uh, I really, that was, that was great. I went to the Visitation con uh, Convent in Georgetown, founded in 1799. Wandered over Georgetown University itself and saw its Jesuit looted chapels, uh, which were all very beautiful once upon a time and now are shadows. Saw the exorcist stairs in Georgetown. Ooh. I did not see the exorcist himself. Uh, well, what does that mean, exorcist stairs? I no, mean, the, the house? Movie. No, no, no. The movie, there, there's, this, there's these stairs that the fellow falls on and all that. Yeah. Goes, yeah. So, I saw those. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I was able to, uh, at Mass, I was able to say a prayer for the soul of William Peter Blatty, whom I actually spoke to once at some point. All right. Yeah, the author of The Exorcist. Right. And a Georgetown grad and a uh, devout, if somewhat unconventional Catholic. Uh, so God rest him and his uh, son, who uh, died before he did. And let me see, what else can I tell you? I did not see the White House or the or anything like that. Went to Virginia, went to Charlottesville, Richmond, the, the real capital. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, the spiritual capital of our real nation. Um, no, it, 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 was, it, was, it was a lot of good. Went to, went to my favorite restaurant in Washington, the Old Europe. What do you get there? Uh, I got venison. Ooh. The venison, and uh, <clears throat> just has, saw some uh, new friends, and really just, just had a very good time. I, I, I love D.C., I love Maryland, I love Virginia, so yeah. it was good. Yeah, that sounds great. I've always wanted to visit there. I see. What? No, nothing, nothing. What, why do you sound offended? No, I'm not offended. Okay, great. The Let's fact that anyone born in Southern California would abandon Los Angeles for even a minute to the seductive cry of our nation's capital <laughs> is just horrific. So you committed a horror? No, I was born in New York. I can do what I want. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, okay. I rule everyone else. I have my marriage and my other laws. I, for me, none, none of this stuff applies. Oh, I see. If that makes you happy or not. Well, that makes sense. All right. That makes sense to you. It doesn't to me. But anyway, do we have any, uh, what, what good stuff do we have today? Uh, before we get started today, uh, okay. I have a little something for our fans. Uh, people ask me all the time, what can they do to help? And uh, I generally told them, write a book review on Amazon, especially if you read Charles's books. Um, it doesn't need to be Shakespeare. 
just one sentence, you know, saying what you like about the book. Oh, brilliant insights, uh, easy reading. Made my, life, made my life worth living. Wow. Yeah, I was near suicidal until I read Charles Kula. <laughs> wow. Now I know. Well, if that's true, if that's yeah. true, put that down. Not if it's a lie. No, not if it's a lie. Um, yeah, so, you know, Amazon gets a lot of, of new readers familiar with Charles and Tumblr House books. So it's, it's a really important uh, place to get exposure. Um, I mean, to me, it, it's equivalent of a $20 donation, just a single review. It generates sales. And you to be know. honest with you, bad reviews are also sometimes have. And if you want to overcome them, you must overcome bad with good. That's right. That's right. Especially in the review field. Yeah. So, send in uh, some book reviews. Um, the, uh, another thing uh, that we need is we need people to do subtitles for our, our, our video segments. Um, we want to put our videos on Facebook. Uh, Regina Magazine, big Catholic organization, 65,000 Facebook followers, they're going to post videos of Charles, but they need subtitles for them. And the way you can do that is through YouTube. Um, on this webpage, if you click the More button and then the Transcript button, click the drop-down menu and click Add Subtitles. And they have this nice, easy system for you to do it. Put it in there. I'll get to review it. And then soon enough, you'll see it, uh, your work broadcasted on Facebook. That's right. And also, for people who can't hear, they'll have, been, uh, they'll have lost their excuse for not dealing with us. That's true. Yeah. That's true. Um, so, yeah, and also thank you so much to everybody who's already submitted to us uh, subtitles and book reviews. Thank you. We, we know who you are, and we are very appreciative. More than you know. Yeah. And that's it. All right. Well, let's it get means questions. Questions, okay. yes. What do we got? Uh, first two questions are, is from uh, Christianos. Christianos, all right. What is the scripture, uh, scriptural basis for priestly celibacy? None. No, that's actually not quite true. Uh, St. Peter and the other apostles left their wives behind and everything else to follow our Lord. And that is the beginning of it. Now, of course, priestly celibacy is a discipline, not a dogma. Uh, in the early church, priests uh, had wives, but it's important to remember that that didn't last very long. It didn't last very long for a reason, as any married priest can tell you. Uh, part of it is giving oneself entirely to the church. It's a spiritual thing. Part of it, uh, as St. Uh, Paul tells us when he says, I wish you were as me, he says it's better that... Uh, Better to marry than to burn, but he's keen on one giving oneself entirely to the church. And every married priest I've known, and I have known a number, have always felt that they were either cheating, they've always felt on one side they're either cheating their family or their people. Yeah, because it's like two vocations. It's that two they vocations have to at once. Now, in the Eastern rites of the church, uh, as well as the Eastern Orthodox, of course, and with the Anglican use of the Catholic Church, they will ordain married men. But in all those cases, if a, uh, uh, a man's wife dies, they will not allow him to marry again. So if you're a widower, you're stuck, and they will not allow married bishops. Mm. So if you want to be a bishop, if you're very ambitious, don't you be getting married. Yeah. Um, pre Priestly celibacy seems like, you know, a case just out of pure pragmatism. I mean, um, you don't want your priest to... Be, to to think, okay, do I go to Little Timmy's ball game, or should I administer last rites to this person? You don't want your priest in that dilemma. Well, that's part of it. Also, if your priest is dependent on the support of his family for his um, uh, popularity amongst his flock, then he may not preach the, the faith when it's uncomfortable. Yeah, and see, that's another thing. I don't think you should be for married priests unless you're ready to put their kids through college. Pretty much. <laughs> and and mind, mind you, uh, I mean, my godson's a married priest, and he manages uh, pretty well. He's got a lovely wife. Oh, well, he's extraordinary. He's an extraordinary specimen. He is, and there are a number of these folks. And usually, when you've got a married priest, uh, the wife assumes a sort of unofficial role as mother of the parish. Mm. But that's a lot to demand out of a woman. Yeah. Um, when it works, it's great. When it doesn't, it's awful. Yeah. So, anyway. Well, we should probably just clarify, uh, the person we're referring to is Anglican ordinariate. Yeah. Not, 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 not an Anglican priest in, you know, outside the yeah. church. 
He's very, very much, as much a Catholic as I am, and maybe better. Yeah. Um, oh, one other thing, too. I mean, I, I, one of our, you know, I know a Greek Orthodox priest, and, you know, the pay is so poor, bad that he has to work on the side as an insurance adjuster. Yeah, which is so, also not a good thing. You don't want your priest having to work on the side as an insurance adjuster. That's, that's not a good thing. No, let alone bouncer at a nightclub. Yeah, wow. How, <laughs> we, how do we go to that? That was just random. What else we got? Second question from uh, Christianos. Would you say, or what would you say is the definition of a traditionalist? If someone asks what being a traditionalist means, it's often difficult to even say because that would require unraveling the myriad of errors that are just so absolutely embedded in our culture today. That's very true, and also tradition means different things to different people. So, for instance, in Catholic circles, traditionalist generally means someone who holds to the traditions of the Church prior to Vatican II. Uh, in a philosophical sense, a traditionalist or a perennialist holds that there is a uh, pre-existing tradition in, with, and under all mankind's faiths that uh, you know is a wisdom tradition going back to the early ages and so on and so on and so on. Uh, which I am definitely not. Yeah. Uh, another kind of traditionalism is philosophical traditionalism, which um, holds that all learning is inherited from the past, and that we can learn nothing new, um, and that really holds thought itself in some suspicion. Mm. Um, that's another kind of traditionalism I wouldn't hold. So to answer your question, it's very difficult. You have to be specific about what kind of tradition it is you're trying to uphold. So, if you just say, I'm a traditionalist, that could mean anything. I mean, does that mean you're upholding the, uh, the, the dear old Dutch traditions, the Knickerbocker Dutch or the Hudson Valley? <laughs> you know, you're a member of the Holland Society and the St. Nicholas Society of New York and all that? I think he's referring to the popular context of the word. Well, even in the popular context, I mean... If someone comes up to you and says he's a traditionalist, if he, if he means the Catholic traditionalist, um, how far is he going to take that? Is he going to keep Lent the way it was in the 18th century or the way it was in 1950? That's true. Um, you know, is he going to keep the fasting for midnight or Pius XII's three hour fast, Paul VI's one hour fast? Well, okay, I mean, see, well, you're getting more specific. So, traditionalist well, has a big... Well, you said too general, and you said too specific. But it's, but it's... No, I didn't say you were too general. I said you were um, identifying different contexts yeah. which people don't I identify with that were apart from the popular context. Well, what is the popular context, then? The, con the popular context, I would say, is the big umbrella where you abide by pr uh, teachings pre-Vatican II, as well as... Yeah, well, whatever that, comes after. So specifically Catholic? Yeah. Okay, well, again, a lot depends on a lot. I mean, you'll have some traditionalists, for instance, who reject uh, Pius XII's new uh, right of Holy Week. Okay. You know, uh, when do we fix tradition? 1950? 1350? Well, can't there, can't there be various branches of traditionalism? <laughs> Well, there are, because you've got, I mean, you've got people disagreeing, you know, more traditional than now. There used to be, it's, it's gone on, unfortunately, but there was a very funny satire site online called the Society of St. Pius I. Okay. They demanded the liturgy in Greek. Wow. As it was at the beginning, and they said, and, uh, you know, we, Latin is a corruption of, uh, the Latin mass is a corruption of the original Greek liturgy of the Western Rite. And, so, and in case you were wondering, we don't like the Greek Orthodox either, <laughs> the, because they've strayed too far. Uh, I mean, you know, the, the problem, I think, for a lot of people, is that tradition becomes a tribal name, rather than something that you're trying to maintain for its own sake. Mm, that's a good point. It's, you know, I'm a traditionalist, unlike you. Oh, you call yourself a traditionalist? I'll bet you don't even fast and stay on ever days. <clears throat> While I was in Washington, I hope everyone was keeping the Ember Days. I know I would have been if I'd been home. Okay. You could say that, and you should keep the Ember Days, actually. Yeah. 
but making it, and this is the, the uh, a prime uh, temptation to avoid, is making it a sort of litmus test, uh, a kind of what our liberal friends would call virtue signaling. Right. I keep the Ember Days. Oh, and by the way, I keep the Rogation Days, too. To which my response is, really? And do you go in procession on the Rogation Days? Well, my chapel doesn't do that. So you don't go by yourself or on the boundaries of the parish. I know. Well... A real traditionalist would keep Rogation tied properly. And it's coming up. Yeah, yeah. Um... Boy, by the way, just speaking of uh, uh, historical uh, attitudes toward Lent, I was reading Geringer, uh, and boy, he is rough on Lent. He shows that in order to get a dispensation, it was so serious that if a king, a king would need to get a dispensation. And just because you get a dispensation from the fasting portion doesn't mean you get a, a dispensation from the abstinence of meat portion. Correct. He was ferocious on this. He sure was. And then he said... Uh, and if you do get all of these things, don't think you're being virtuous. Yeah. You know, he's, when it comes to Lent, he's smacking you around. Yeah. And deservedly. I mean, well, let's, not, let's not forget that the current canonical requirement for Lent, remember uh, somebody got annoyed at me for not mentioning the canonical requirement yes. by saying that once you be penitential in Advent and pointing out, well, no, no, it's not, not, not canonical. You're right. I'll tell you what is canonical. What is canonical is abstaining on the Fridays of Lent, abstaining from meat, and fasting on Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. Mm -hmm. That is it, canonically. Yeah. That's it. No more. Um, you know, maybe give up cream cheese. So, uh, even though it's not required canonically, go further. Do something else. Yeah, yeah so. you made the point, like, if you do the bare minimum in terms of showing love for your parents, what kind of person are you? A quick peck on your mother's cheek once or once a day. That's yeah. all I need. <laughs> you don't want to hug the woman, I mean, my gosh. Yeah. Okay, uh, next question is from Jack Lerner. What is integralism? It means having integrity. No, that's not what it means. No. It has several different meanings again. In the Catholic sense, uh, about the time uh, that Pius X condemned modernism, a group of Catholics began describing themselves as integral or completely or wholly Catholic. Um, and these were called integrists, integralists, and so on. Uh, and some of them, uh, most notably Monsignor Umberto Benini, made the... Uh, part of their work, a concerted attempt to root out the modernists from the church. This went on, and he founded a group called the Sodalitium Pianum to do this very work. Well, they would, you know, censor and jump up and down and point out modernists. Well, Pius X uh, died, St. Pius X, it was replaced by Benedict the Fifteenth, who issued an encyclical condemning the use of the phrase integral Catholic versus modern Catholic. It said everyone should just be Catholic. And he also abolished the Sodalitium uh, uh, Pianum, or La Sapiniere, as we call it in French. Um, one might make the argument that uh, Benedict's uh, confidence that modernism had been scotched was a little overconfident. Maybe a little boo boo boo. So that, that's one meaning of it. It has also been used to refer to certain French and Portuguese and Brazilian Catholic uh, political groups who wanted to see the church as an integral part of the nation, mm. uh, of the life of the nation. And of course, generally today, we say they're you know, right-wing fascist, horrible, awful, terrible people, probably because they're not transgendered. But uh, what? Everything that isn't transgender is fascist. You know that. Yeah, anything that promotes inequality in any way is... Uh, is fascist. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but that's what integralism is. So, Axel Francaise was considered by some to be integralist. 
That's interesting. That, that, that strongly, it seems, uh, in the first context, it seems to strongly parallel the concept of traditionalist, which we just talked about. Yes. Is that fair to say? Yes, it is. Uh, it's very fair to say. Uh, and certainly uh, the traditionalists, especially outside of English, are often called integralists. And the Pope's banning of that term, to use that term, would that be equivalent to the, the, uh, the, our current Pope banning traditionalists? Like, I mean, is it that far? No, I mean, no, uh, because you've got to bear in mind that the divisions then were not like they are now. I mean, everybody used the same Mass. Everybody oh. used the same prayers. Oh, I see. So you got to remember it was a whole different world. What you had was a clash of philosophies, which much later on would surface in the world of the everyday Catholic. I see. Uh, when modernism first reared its ugly head, the vast majority of Catholics had no idea what it was and never heard of it. Never even heard of the ideas. This stuff spread in seminaries and theologies and that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, not theologies, uh, seminaries and... Uh, colleges, universities. The average Catholic in the street, unless he knew a modernist priest and they were small and art, would never have had any truck with them, wouldn't have known anything about them. Today, the situation has become such a Barnum and Bailey's circus that everything's noticeable. I see. Okay, so it sounds like the Pope, it sounds like everyone was pretty much united, but he wanted to prevent uh, risk of fracturing. Exactly. Unnecessarily. Exactly. Yeah. Whereas now we are fractured. <laughs> now we are fractured, yeah. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Next question is from Ethan. What is your opinion on Oswald Mosley and the British Union of Fascists? I've heard that Mosley and his black shirts received much support from English Catholics because of how similar his ideology was to Catholic social te teaching. Is there any truth to this? <sighs> Whose was the face that launched a thousand ships, Sir Oswald Mosley or Sir Stafford Cripps? <laughs> well, Sir Stafford Cripps was a labor politician. All right, Sir Oswald Mosley, British Union of Fascists. Sir Oswald Mosley was a baronet, I met his son actually, who had not heard that rhyme I just said for you. Oh. Uh, now he has, so it's part of his life, I guess. But Sir Oswald was a baronet, member of Parliament, who uh, had been conservative, was very much uh, turned off by the conservative lack of response to the Depression and the plight of the working classes. Kind of like Edward VIII when he was king, going into the Welsh coal mining and getting everybody so upset by saying something needs to be done. You know, the Prime Minister, Stanley Baldwin, was very annoyed that the king would have had an opinion about anything. Mm. Well, similarly, Sir Oswald was very upset by this, so he formed a, a uh, he left um, the Conservative Party and joined the Labour Party, becoming a socialist in hopes of improving the lot of the working man and so forth. Uh, but then he came to the conclusion that Labour was no better than the Tories; they were just another bunch of hack politicians, and he created what was called the New Party that lasted for a year or so. But, what's happening in the meantime? Well, in the meantime, in Italia, in 1922, you had the March on Rome, which brought into power Benito Mussolini. Now, we only think of Mussolini as the evil ally of Hitler who led his country to ruin. But it's important to remember that in the 1920s, he was the man who kept the Depression from entering Italy. Uh, Italy, who you know, since unification, it looked on as something of a clownish state. Been defeated by the Ethiopians. You know, what do you say about a European power <laughs> defeated by Ethiopia? <laughs> That's embarrassing. It was very embarrassing. It was extremely embarrassing. It really stuck in the Italian scrawl. Yeah. And nobody less than Mussolini, which is why when they went to conquer Ethiopia in 1936, they were so gleeful about it. Because they've been made to look like morons in front of the whole of Europe. Well, Anyway, he, apart from making the trains run on time, which everyone gets excited about, he spared Italy, his rule and his policy spared Italy the worst effects of the Depression, which you couldn't say for uh, Roosevelt or, or Ramsey McDonald or anybody else in, in Europe at the time. So Mosley looked at him, as a lot of other people did, including FDR, 
as perhaps something of a model to follow. And he started the British Union of Fascists in emulation, turned the new party into a fascist party. Now, the Catholic involvement was not great, but there was some. And the reason for this was because of the resemblance of parts of the fascist program and parts of Moses' program to elements of Catholic social teaching. Specifically, Quadrigesimo Anno called for what is called corporatism or the corporate state. Mm. Now what that basically means is that rather than being organized necessarily geographically with no other connecting interest, the electorate be involved according to profession. So you would have these corporations, and they'd be a bit like the medieval guilds, in the sense that they would, uh, at least as far as the Catholic concept was, they would look after your religious life, but they would include labor, capital, retail, of any given industry. So like it would, uh, the shoe the shoe company, mm -hmm. you know, the, shoe, the shoe business, you would unite in one corporation the uh, mass manufacturers of shoes, the shoe stores, the shoe specialty shops, and the United Shoe Workers. And all these would be in a single corporation, which would be represented in Parliament. Interesting. So in other words, your voting and all that would be on the basis not of simply where you lived, but what you do. Mm. I like that. Well, it lent itself to, to a lot of things. But the problem, and, and corporatism was also very closely allied to what was called an English Guild Socialism, A.J. Penty, who, and distributism and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing about corporatism, though, is that it doesn't really work purely as an economic system divorced from every other consideration. It needs an overarching philosophy behind it to animate it, to give it a reason for being. Mm. Uh, for, in, for Catholic social teaching purposes, it was the faith. For uh, Mussolini, it was the state. Uh. And for Hitler, who adopted some of the corporatist ideas, it was the race. But unfortunately, as a result of World War II, uh, corporatism got a dirty name. It was tarred with the Nazi brush. And of course, anything that's tarred with the Nazi brush uh, must be Nazi. Just like any country allied with Joseph Stalin must have been communist. Uh, we were. Okay, moving on. Yeah. I don't like it when you force my face into that kind of stuff. But, uh, yeah, so, at any rate, uh, that there were some Catholics who supported Sir Oswald, but he never had anything like a majority of Catholic support. He did have one important disciple who was Catholic, named William Joyce, uh, who was actually an American citizen, but he uh, fled to Britain, uh, fled Britain for Germany in the outbreak of war, and became a radio announcer doing German propaganda. And he was called Lord Haw Haw. <laughs> that was his nickname. Uh, and he would begin every show with Berlin calling. Interesting. And, okay. and he spoke with a very cut glass accent. Oh, that's the other thing. Uh, Sir Oswald and uh, Lady Mosley, having become close to uh, Mussolini, eventually became close to Hitler himself. And so many years later, after Mosley had died, I, I heard... Lady Mosley interviewed on the radio, and uh, they said, well, you know, Lady Mosley, what did you met him, what did you think of him? And she said, he was a perfect da. A perfect what? Da. I don't know what that is. Deer? The, yes. Oh, perfect deer. A perfect da. Okay. She was unreconstructed. Oh, well, th that goes without saying. Yeah. Uh, personally, I think if you're going to call somebody a perfect dad, they probably should not be Adolf Hitler. Probably. I would consider him a man of the people, but I don't mean it as a compliment. Yeah. But let's go on. Okay. Next question is from Juan Santiago. Yes, sir. What you got? Why has Mexico not been as successful like Western countries? Uh, because it's close to the United States. 
We've been successful. We're close to the United States. And we made a well, it's true. We made a point of making sure Mexico wasn't. I mean, read bloodstained altars, no God next door, that kind of thing. The United States have consistently, since the independence of Mexico, backed regimes almost guaranteed to keep Mexico from ever realizing its potential. Wow. Uh, I mean, you go back to the very beginning in 1821, we sent down as our ambassador from uh, Monroe, a gentleman by the name of Joel Poinsett. Mm -hmm. uh, he brought back a beautiful plant called the Poinsettia, which illumines our Christmas. But he left behind something called Poinsettismo, which is American intervention in Mexican internal affairs. He also introduced Freemasonry to Mexico. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. So uh, when the, the Catholic conservatives still began to fight the anti-clerical liberals, uh, the United States backed the liberals to the, uh, you know, to the uh, hilt. Okay. And then, as, as you can guess, when, uh, uh, as soon as the war was over and we could back Juarez against Maximilian, we did so. Uh, we backed the pre against the Cristeros, getting a picture. Okay. There's a saying in Spanish, which in English is, poor little Mexico, so far from God and so close to the United States. <laughs> so, I mean, there are other, there, they have some of their own problems, of course, that have not been helpful. But we played a huge part in that country being in the state she's in. I see. Okay, and I think a long time ago in high school when we were studying comparative governments, I think the one thing I remember about Mexico is they seem to suggest that corruption was a part of the system, as in it was like an expectation. It was so baked in. Yes. Like, oh, you want something done? Here, give me my payout, and then you'll get it done. Yeah, and I, I would add to it that as a result of all that, the citizen does not identify with the state the way he does here. How is it different? Well, uh, when the government uh, dukes it out with the cartels, the citizens look on as though it was, you know, somebody else's problem. I don't understand. I, I don't get. It. I don't understand what you're getting at. Well, I mean, think back to the Cristero Band, the Cristiana. People's allegiance to the state was limited. You know, especially if they were good Catholics. Uh huh. Well, that's continued to to, to fester. So that many Mexicans simply do not feel it's their government, it's the government. And so when the government fights out with the cartels, they just sort of sit there as neutrals. I see. Okay. Doesn't do a lot for your civic spirit. No, it doesn't. That's too bad. Yeah. Okay, next question is from Thomas Comerford. What would you say is the most effective way to convert Protestants? It seems kind of difficult to me because all of them seem to have been lied to by their pastors about virtually everything the Catholic faith holds and teaches. Well, that's true. That's true. But uh, with me, one of, the, one of the things I always found very important is the argument from history. Are you really going to say that the faith was corrupt for the first 1,500 years and it's only the last 500 years that the truth's come out? If that's true, then Christ is a liar because he said the gates of hell would never prevail against the church, and the Protestant argument has to be that they did. Uh, right, I see. That's, that was sort of, I always felt that that was a silver bullet that everyone should use, but it must not work. Well, it doesn't work because people don't want it to. I mean, one thing I remember, ladies and gentlemen, is that if people, for whatever reason, are emotionally tied to something, or whatever it might be, they will be immune to logic. If you come to me trying to talk to, to me about the health benefits of red wine, and my dad was an alcoholic who ruined my life, yeah. you know what? Save your breath. Um, there's no, no one, one size fits all fixture for this stuff. I, I, I was talking with this with somebody, and I think they're representing the Protestant side. Um, uh, and they said, uh, the faith of Peter is what was built on, not Peter himself. Yeah. What is, I don't know what that means, but... It, uh, neither do they. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's, it's nonsense. I mean, similarly, unless a man eat my body and drink my blood, he shall not have life in him. 
unless the man is born again of water and the Holy Ghost, he shall not have the kingdom of God. Uh, who, who I give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven. Uh, that all gets thrown out the window. My personal favorite was the lady who, when I explained the claims of the church, uh, said, well, that's just history. And another one, when I asked her, well, ma'am, where in the Bible does he give authority to the Bible? And where does he give you the list of the books of the Bible? He says, oh, on the uh, contents page. <laughs> so, there's nothing you can do in some cases. When a fellow says to you, if the King James Bible is good enough for Jesus Christ, it's good enough for me. I mean, okay, so, I mean, is that it? I mean, is that... I well, mean, is I, there look, more? you can't... What you're really asking me is how do you break someone's free will? Hmm. If they reject out of hand everything you say, then, you know, if God can't get through to them, how do you suppose you're going to? He, he, he's asking, how do you open their mind? They have to be of good will, and you have to be willing to respond to it. But you can't open their minds against their will. God can't do it, you can't do it. I mean, look, take, if you will, um, well, the guy who just died, uh, America's chaplain, Billy Graham. Billy Graham knew all about the Catholic faith. Okay. Billy Graham had hung out with Fulton Sheen, uh, Cardinal Cushing, of course, that great sump of Catholic truth. Um, but he knew the Catholic faith. He wouldn't accept it. What? I wonder why. Oh, I can imagine a few reasons, but not being the judge of the living and the dead, I'm not quite sure I want to reveal them. But suffice to say that had he become a Catholic, he couldn't have been ordained a priest. And in those days, they didn't have the uh, professional Catholic evangelist ex-preachers who have uh, developed in the past 20 years. What would have happened to the Billy Graham Crusades if Billy Graham had become Catholic? Mm. What would the thousands or millions of people in the Protestant world who swore by him they have done had he become Catholic. I see. So, Billy Graham wasn't a true evangelist as some prominent Catholic media figures have said? Wasn't uh, a, it wasn't a true evangelist? Depends on whether or not to be a true evangelist you have to be evangelizing with the truth. Oh, but he's bringing people closer to Jesus Christ. Which one? He? The Jesus Christ who transubstantiates onto countless altars every day, or the one who is simply revered like the Blessed Virgin Mary? Oh, I see. But it's still a step closer, nevertheless. So what? Uh, Doesn't that count for anything? It does. Oh, yeah, your United Nations pin, what? There you go, good American. Yeah. Do you trick or treat for UNICEF? <laughs> what? Do you trick or treat for UNICEF? I don't trick or treat for UNICEF. And you call yourself an American. I, I don't know. I don't know what you're saying. I, I just feel that you're, you're pulling this country apart. That's what I, <laughs> no, what I was saying. No, uh, Billy Graham uh, epitomized the Protestant mind. It, uh, he got... His message became less and less distinct as he went along, until finally he simply said that uh, you know, God calls people from every clime and religion, and they'll all be saved as long as God calls them. Well, that's great because it means that you don't need any human action. Yeah. Which is, I mean, we Catholics pioneered that point of view. We were, we were, um, we showed the Protestants how to be lazy. Yeah, that's true. Also, uh, another thing occurred to me, we just put up uh, your old talk on the uh, Athanasian Creed, which is sort of the perfect talk in light of how to approach Billy Graham, I feel. Uh, you know? Well, Billy Graham, I, I will have to say this, though, about Billy Graham. Mm -hmm. He was like Ronald Reagan. He was like the Queen. 
and one of the last adults remaining to us. Something that predated the counterculture that all of our owners in church and state are still in. Oh, he's from the before time. The before time. He is a comfy character from the before time. And as long as Billy Graham is still alive, it's a little comfier. <laughs> and now he's gone. And yeah, I'd be lying if I said that I don't miss Billy Graham. I do. Wow. Because he's like Norman Rockwell, like Irving Berlin. Uh. He's part of my America. The America that is slowly dying a shameful transgender death before my very eyes. I see. Not that I'm bitter. Okay. Um, you know, uh, just one, uh, one random thing. Since we're talking about conversion, um, in my church they have this pamphlet, Top Ten Reasons People Join the Catholic Faith. You know what the number one reason is, interestingly? It's the Eucharist. Oh, yeah. They want to see the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Even though our Lord didn't mean what he was saying when he said, Unless I eat my body and drink my blood, etc. So I think that's an interesting route, route, is creating that thing. Well, well, we have the body and blood of Jesus. Don't you want that? Don't you want communion? Well, yeah, I mean, that, that's a very important thing, it's a, and it, it can be a very important message. Um, but you run into problems. If you, let's put it this way, more people will do something out of, sadly, out of fear than out of love. Fear that you'll lose your soul if you don't become a Catholic is a more immediate threat than wanting the Eucharist. That's true. Now, having said that, That's true. I would say it's probably nobler to want the Eucharist than to simply fear for the loss of your soul. Although I could be wrong. I mean, it, seem, it just seems nicer to me, a better, a better reason. But you know, the reason doesn't matter so long as you come to the truth one way or the other. Hmm. Um, voluntarily, of course. I'm not saying that we need to uh, forcibly baptize everyone the way that uh, the, the Chinese warlord Feng Yusheng did. The Chinese warlord forced baptize everybody? Yeah. They called him the Christian general during the 20s and he used to baptize people en masse with a water hose. Is that valid? I wouldn't think so. But he was not what you would call a deep theologian. Wow. That's surprising, coming from China. Yeah. That's probably why he was so, uh, so vociferous about it. You'll find that the most vociferous Christians of any kind, or, or, or most vociferous anything of anything, are converts. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, our last question is from Sylvain Duran. Hello, Sylvain. Greetings again, fellow papists. Mm. In the Father Baptist novels, many characters describe themselves as ultra-realists. Could the always sagacious Charles Coulomb explain what an ultra-realist is? By the way, I finished the fifth novel. Please tell Mr. Beersack that I'm ready for the next one. <laughs> okay. All right, we'll tell him that. Uh, we're ready for it, too. Yeah. Uh, I've read it. Oh, right. Because it's written, that, yeah. Earlier versions. I've read it. I could actually tell right here, right now. I could tell everybody what happens. Spoiler alert. Hello. I'm not going to do it. Okay. I just said I could do You're it. You're very privileged. Yeah, I'm privileged. I check my privilege. You check your white privilege. That's right. <laughs> anyway. Uh, Ultra-realism, well, it is a philosophical concept. Uh... One of the big philosophical motifs that was originated by a fellow called Plato uh, was the idea of the universals, the archetypes. And these ranged from things that were very concrete, like man or chair or horse, to more uh, in, uh, intangible things like honor, beauty, etc. Now, for Plato, existent things on this plane of reality uh, were like a chair is a chair because it has chairness, it reflects the, the, the chair in some realm of the, of the unseen, 
where all the archetypes dwell. Uh, this elaborates in what is called, his piece called The Cave. And we see basically what we see in terms of, well, chairs, mm -hmm. are reflections of that archetype. Okay. Well, along came the Christians. And they baptized Plato's work. They didn't baptize Plato because he was long dead. Oh. But they baptized a lot of his work. Christian Neoplatonism was called. All the church fathers and most of the early scholastics were Neoplatonists. And they adopted this view of uh, Plato's, except that they didn't place it in some realm of the universals out there somewhere, but in the mind of God. Ah. So the mind of God, the chair that exists in the mind of God is real. It's more real than the examples we see in front of us. But it's from that chair in the mind of God that these chairs derive their chairness. Interesting. All right. So they were called realists because they believed they were real. Well, it came to be called ultra-realists uh, uh, ultra because uh, Aristotle came forward with the idea that, yeah, the, uh, the uh, archetypes, the, the, the platonic um, types are real, but they derive their reality from the sum total of their concrete expressions. So in other words, chair exists because of all the chairs that exist. They define chair. So rather than being up in the mind of God, it was here on earth being, you know, the, you might say the multiple creation at any one time of all the chairs that exist. Wow. And that was called moderate realism. Mm -hmm. Well, there arose a reaction to that called conceptualism which taught that there, was, there were concepts in the mind of man, but had no real reality. And then lastly, my personal favorite, nominalism, <clears throat> which taught they were just words with no, uh, no uh, real meaning at all. Wow. So, that was it. Okay. Um, and who are, is it, didn't, didn't, isn't St. Bonaventure one of the great ultra-realists? He sure is. Um, I think... As a side tangent, a lot of people, or several people, wrote in asking for ultra-realist resources. Oh, boy. I should probably write a list. But, uh, isn't it Etienne, Etienne Gilson's uh, Life of St. Bonaventure? Is that, is that one? Is that yeah. One? And also, uh, if you get a hold of Frederick Copleston's uh, History of Medieval Philosophy, he has a number of them. Um, Okay. They tend to be Franciscans, so people like Duns Scotus and uh, uh, Blessed uh, Raymond Lully uh, were, rea were Platonic realists. If I remember correctly, uh, Father Aidan Nichols, Nichols yeah. is, you considered him an ultra-realist even though he doesn't abide by that term. Yeah, I do. I don't think he, I, I don't think he would use the term of himself, but I, I suspect he's one. Okay. He's certainly much more of a Platonist than Aristotelian. Moderate realism was all bound up with Aristotle, and so was St. Thomas. Mm -hmm. uh, the the um, conceptualism was given us by Abelard, of Eloise and Abelard fame. And nominalism came to us from William of Ockham. But you know who the most famous nominalist was? Who? Martin Luther. Uh. And then when he left the church, he rejected scholasticism completely. Wow. Okay, um, the, an, another uh, resource for you guys, if you want to look up ultra-realism, is the ultra-realism uh, frequently asked questions from tumblehouse.com. You go to Charles's page, and uh, we link to it from there, and there's also a monarchy frequently asked questions if you're interested in monarchism, yeah. and written by this man himself, and it's, it, it, um, it, we well, should handle every every question that you have on either either topic, and it's a great resource. Two facts for the price of one, and how much they cost. That's right. Two facts, Shapur. Two facts, Shapur. What? That, it sounds like you're trying to say Tupac Shakur, the rapper. Yes, that's what I said. <laughs> you know Tupac? No, personally. You like any of his music? Not really. How do you know Tupac? Uh, 
What no? <laughs> no, I, I I ran into him in a bar in Compton yesterday. No, that's not true. No, that, yeah. Okay. Anyway. Anyway. Okay. That'll do it for our show. If you enjoyed listening to Charles, remember to subscribe to the Tumblr House YouTube channel. Um, if you'd like to send Charles a question, you can do so through the Tumblr House uh, website, the Contact Us page. See you next time. God bless. Be good. Bye-bye.